Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at cap modding, which is one of my personal favorite modifications because it's really easy, and that's by my standards, not by normal people standards, obviously, but it is a simple modification. It doesn't require any data sheets. Um, you just, like, it is easy to screw up. That, that's for sure. Basically, any hardware modification you do, if you short circuit V core to ground, dead card. If you do. You know, there's a lot of things, as soon as you start using a soldering iron on a PCB, there's a lot of things that no matter what you're doing are always going to be a risk. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but unlike, say, volt mods or uh, trying to modify power limits or disable some kind of power limit or uh, something like that, this is a lot easier compared to that because those require that you figure out how the voltage, some random voltage controller, which may or may not have good documentation, works, and then actually, you know, getting it to, and then actually applying that modification. Whereas here, you just need to not do some, like, you know, not do s certain stupid things and end up with a card that doesn't work. But, uh, yeah, so. Why would you want to cap mod? So cap modding is basically, you know, I'm, I'm not actually sure how I'm going to go about this video, but um, normally if we talk about a voltage on when overclocking, you know, uh, like say this GTX uh, 680 here, this is a pallet GeForce 680. So it's not a reference board though. It might look like it's a reference card because of the cooler, but it's not. It has an eight pin and a six pin, not a six plus six, um, which I think a stock 680 is two six pins. But uh, yeah, this is a six plus eight. The VRM is some kind of six phase, I think. It might be a doubled up three, but yeah, it's not, not a great card. Um, but you know, if you run this thing, GPU Z reports that this thing is running on 1.175 volts. Now, if you actually go and take a multimeter right to the back of the core, you'll find out it's not running at 1.175 volts at all. It's running at around 1.15 because the VRM is over here and the GPU is there. So basically there's a ton of voltage drop going from, you know, it, it dumps all of its power here. And then you have all of this copper going, basically one of these phases is gonna be strained a lot more than all the other ones because it's closer to the, uh, GPU core. So yeah, you end up in a situation that um, this doesn't actually get the voltage that the software reports because of voltage drop. But you know, that's not a huge issue. What's a lot more concerning and what the cap mod actually takes care of is the fact that the voltage on right behind the GPU core when you check it with an oscilloscope looks like this. Um, that's from 3D Mark Fire Strike Graphics Test 1. Bone stock PCB. The only thing I added was basically this tab right here. This, that little tab. And that's there so that I could hook up the oscilloscope to something. Come on, focus, you useless camera. It's not that hard to focus. My little brother can focus to, better than this. Come on. Oh, whatever. I give up. So that little tab over there, uh, that's for measuring the voltage right behind the GPU core. And then for grounding, I have another tab down here. Um, obviously, I tried to get the tabs as close to the GPU core as possible so that I'm measuring the voltage fluctuations right here because actually if I move this tab from here to the end of this VRM, which I did have that once, you get wildly different uh, readings for, uh, for the voltage fluctuations. So what you're seeing there is I can't actually see what you're seeing right now because I'm trying to do this while recording, which is genius, but whatever. Um, what you're seeing over there right now is that the voltage is really not steady. And in fact, it's fluctuating between, memory serves me correctly, 1.03 volts at the lowest and 1.26 volts at peak. So that basically means this VRM and then obviously the GPU core itself because the, the reason for all of that voltage fluctuation is part of it is the VRM. The VRM has MOSFET switching on and off in it. Um, when the high side MOSFET in a phase turns on, the voltage output of that phase starts going up. Um, and so naturally the voltage you see on the entire thing starts going up uh, with it. And that causes some fluctuations. And when, you know, that FET shuts off and it switches to the low side MOSFET, that one turns on, you start seeing the voltage drop down instead of rise up. So you get voltage fluctuations just due to the switching uh, of the VRM itself.
Um, and this can be negated with more phases, faster switching frequencies. You know, you, you can get VRMs that even without very many capacitors would run ridiculously clean. But unfortunately, we do not live in a world where um, GPUs and other silicon semiconductors like RAM and, and CPUs, they, they do not run on constant current. If they were constant current, um, VRMs would have a very easy time of dealing with that. It'd be really easy. No, uh, GPU cores are constant voltage and current varying wildly. In fact, um, for comparison's sake, that's the kind of voltage fluctuation you see in GT1. This is what GT2 looks like. You can actually tell what, <laughs> what freaking workload the GPU is doing based on the pattern of voltage fluctuation in the, in, in, uh, on the back of the GPU core because basically when the voltage goes up, the GPU is doing less work. When the voltage goes down, the GPU is doing more work, pulling more current, and you can see that reflected in those voltage graphs over there. Um, which is, you know, like, that's why you do cap mods, to reduce that voltage fluctuation as much as possible, because basically what happens is the VRM is not really aware exactly of what the GPU is doing. If the GPU told the VRM in advance, hey, uh, watch out, I'm about to ask for 200 amps and we're only doing 20 now, the VRM wouldn't have an issue. But that's not what actually happens. The GPU goes from, say, uh, 20 amps current load to 200 in basically instantly. Uh, and the VRM lags behind that. Um, and since the VRM lags behind that, what would normally happen is the inductors would just discharge until there's no more voltage left in them. And that, that would be just a catastrophe. Your voltage would fluctuate up and down because ultimately the inductors in a VRM are trying to push a constant current. And if your current is not constant, they're going to push the voltage up and down to try get the current constant. So if your current draw drops massively, they drive the voltage up. If your current draw increases massively, your voltage goes down for inductors. Now, uh, capacitors are what is used to deal with that because they will basically, if the voltage starts going up, the capacitors will soak up the excess energy that the inductors are dumping in the form of that extra voltage. Well, they're trying to dump it, so they're driving up the voltage. Um, so you can have capacitors and they'll basically soak up that excess energy. Uh, and then when there is a shortage of power for the GPU core, the capacitors will drop it. And that's uh, why you would want to add capacitors, because if you have more capacitance, well, more capacitance or better capacitors, or there, there's a variety of variables here, you can't just, you know, you can't just go and buy a super capacitor and expect it to do a great job of uh, basically ripple suppression on very high switching frequencies, because really high frequency stuff needs really low inductance, and uh, that's why, you know, right behind the GPU core, you have which actually, can I get it into shot? There we go. Right behind the GPU core, you have this massive mixture of, you have the large SMD, and I think these are just regular aluminum polymers, not anything fancy like tantalums. Um, you have the large SMD polymers, and then around that, you have all of these different sized ceramics. And that's because various size capacitors, different packaging types, have completely different uh, frequency responses. And then if you actually look at a GPU core, you have all of those little chip capacitors right around those. And you may notice some of them have an even funky, like a, uh, well, they have a different packaging than what you normally see right behind the core to further reduce uh, their inductance so that they're even faster to respond to sudden changes in power requirements. So, you know, basically you just pile on capacitors of various sizes and various capacitances to get as stable voltage as possible. Now, unsurprisingly, um, GPU manufacturers will kind of say, okay, past a certain point, uh, adding more capacitors is just not worth it. It's either physically not possible to fit on the PCB or it just costs too much and it's not worth the effort. I mean, as long as the card runs stock clocks, nobody cares that, oh, you know, uh, an extra 2,000, 10,000 microfarads of capacitance would increase overclocking potential by 10 megahertz, which is really what we're talking about here because that's the kind of gains you, you might end up seeing. Um, it really varies card to card. In my experience, uh, say AMD reference cards, I've seen terrible, and I mean terrible results in terms of cap modding and actually getting any improvement. And then there's things like this GTX 680, which... Uh, 
well, before I broke it, it picked up a nice 15 me megahertz on the core clock, and then before, in earlier testing, it picked up 30, but then it's like, this card has had so many, like, I've put caps on, pulled them off, put them back on, pull, well, can't actually see the card. I put caps on, on this thing, pulled them off, and put them back on so many times that at this point, I'm kind of w w worried that I've, well, I've damaged a lot of the multi-layer ceramics on this thing, uh, and it's already starting to, like, I, I can't replicate some of the results I have from earlier testing, so I think um, that unfor that capacitor right in that area, well, you can't see it, but whatever. Either way, um, <laughs> this card's in a pretty bad shape, but it does pick up a few extra megahertz from the extra capacitors, and, you know, if you're in the business of extreme overclocking, then... A few extra megahertz by just adding capacitors is really not that bad a trade. So, yeah, and basically the difference between, say, without capacitors and with capacitors looks something like this. Now, don't actually look at the graph itself because, uh, well, they're different scaling. So one of them is, I think, 112 millivolts per division, while the other one is like 100 millivolts per division. So they're not accurate. Like, you, you can't eyeball them and say, oh yeah, this one's smaller than the other. It's smaller because the scales are different. But the lower graphs, you will notice that there is all of the little monitoring tabs at the bottom of it. And basically the lower graphs were done on, uh, well, I can't show you now because the graphs are there, but eh. Anyway, um, the lower graphs, uh, I added a whole bunch of capacitance, like 24,000 microfarads, which is a huge amount. Like, that's absolutely massive. That's several multiples of what this card normally comes with. And it's not actually necessary. It's just I have conveniently sized, tw well... It was convenient to fit 12 2,000 microfarad capacitors onto this, so I did that. Um, but anyway, what you'll notice is that under the actual graph, I have various monitors. So there's like voltage maximum, voltage minimum, average voltage, and VPP. So VPP stands for voltage peak to peak. Um, and you'll notice that in the top graphs, the GT1... Uh, you're seeing about 220 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak voltage difference, and GT2, I think, is 230 millivolts. Whereas for the GT1, uh, GT1 and GT2 tests with the much larger, uh, with the extra capacitors, it's actually seeing about 200 millivolts peak-to-peak. -peak. And that basically means there's less voltage fluctuation. It's going less high and less low um, as the load cycles through Firestrike. And actually... The uh, extra 12, uh, you know, the extra 24,000 microfarads led to an overclocking improvement on this card of about 15 megahertz uh, against uh, previous testing. So, they do help. They, they definitely do help. Not necessarily a ton, not always. Uh, and, and some card, like, it really depends on the card. If you take a card which is, like, excellent out of the factory, like, say, a Lightning, a Matrix, or a Hall of Fame, and you start piling capacitors onto that, the probability of them actually helping anything is basically zero because, well, Galax and Asus and MSI have kind of done that for you. But if you have old junk hardware or some junk reference card and you want to bench it for hardware points, then adding extra capacitors is a great way to pick up a few extra megahertz, which may help you get first place. Also note that all of this testing was done at stock voltage because it's faster for me without having to figure out how to mod like, because this card, as far as I know, doesn't support software voltage control, or at least I don't mess with NVIDIA's enough to know how to do it without a hard mod. And I kind of say, I'm kind of saving the hard voltage hard mod on this thing for a future video. So uh, this was all done on stock voltage. If you actually crank up the output voltage of the VRM, then obviously the amount of current the GPU is pulling increases, which means those voltage graphs would actually look worse. Um, and the potential for the extra capacitors to improve them would be larger. So the difference between no mods and with mods would be larger if I was running a higher voltage than that 1.14 average that you're actually seeing on those graphs. So, um, now let's put those graphs off the screen and talk about actually implementing this modification because you decided that several hours and, you know, the potential of a dead card is actually worth 15 megahertz. Um... Well, uh, it's actually really easy to do this modification. And first of all, you know, uh, you'd have your selection of capacitors. So basically with choosing your capacitors, you want, need to choose capacitors that are rated for a higher voltage than whatever you're trying to, 
uh, regulate. And you want to give yourself a lot of headroom up top. Um, by which I mean, this technically runs on like 1.14 volts average. If they made 1.2 volt capacitors, I wouldn't use them on this because this peaked, according to those oscilloscope shots, at 1.26, and that would kill those capacitors. They wouldn't survive that much voltage. So basically, um, you need to get some extra headroom in. So, you know, there's no downside to using a massive capacitor, except that you're going to pay a lot more money and you're not going to get as good specs as if you buy a smaller one. So you can get some ridiculous... Uh, like low electro uh, equivalent series resistances on capacitors spec at say two volts um, for really cheap. Like you can get really cheap two volt capacitors with incredible ESR. The only downside is they're two volts. So you can't use them on anything that runs on say 1.8 because if something runs on 1.8, then there's a pretty good chance it might spike above one, two volts for a short period of time and the capacitors won't necessarily survive that. So you want to have some headroom. So if you're modding something like an AM3 Plus motherboard, um, then you'd want to use like a 3 volt or a 4 volt capacitor because on AM3 Plus on liquid nitrogen, you'd run as much as 2.1 volts or even 2.2 on some CPUs. Um, and, you know, if you had a 2.5 volt capacitor, it wouldn't necessarily survive that. Uh, similarly, you know, if... if if you're working on, say, a Pascal series graphics card, which these top out at like 1.6, then knock yourself out, use a 2 volt capacitor. Um, here, the basically the ones that you saw in the graphs were these red ones. These are the 2000 microfarads. These are 6.3 volts rated, 5000 hours, 7 milliohm ESR, and, you know, they're, they're big, they're bulky. They work pretty good, as they did manage to make this thing overclock better. But, uh... You know, uh, it kind of depends what you're aiming for. They are really big, and they're very high capacitance, and they won't necessarily always help that much. Um, generally, you'll notice that, assuming you have enough of them, small SMDs like this kind, which actually, these are set four SMD capacitors uh, sort of soldered together into this more convenient uh, cell thing. I don't know what to call this. Group, bank, whatever. Um, basically, I pack them up like this so that I can, you know, they're easier to solder onto things because they actually have legs and I'm not relying on finding existing pads for SMDs. Now, there is a downside to, like, repackaging them like this, and that is basically any extra wire length uh, reduces the capabilities of the capacitors to suppress high-frequency uh, voltage fluctuations. Now, generally, um, you know, so you basically want to keep your wiring short. The shorter, the better, but you don't have to go absolutely crazy on it because, you know, even, well, even this length works just fine. It just depends on what you're working with. So, yeah. So I use these. And then, of course, if you want, so these are tantalums. You can also get aluminum polymers in an SMD package. Those are actually really, really great um, in general. I've had good experiences with them. Other people have had good experiences with using them for cap mods as well. Um, these big one, like, you know, your usual can, can type, can style polymers, they're cheap, like really cheap. Um, they're much cheaper than the SMD stuff, but they won't all, like, they're not as good. They're not as high performance. They won't always yield any results. Um, but you know, they're so cheap. It's like you might pick up with some, up some as well. And also there's some cards where they're just capacitance hogs, like this thing. This needs a huge amount of capacitance to, like, improve at all. Um, because even when I was using tantalums, I needed at least uh, 18,000 microfarads to make an improvement in terms of uh, overclocking on this thing. So that sucked. But that, <laughs> that sucks on this card. But then there's other cards where, you know, a couple, uh, like, I think four or five little SMDs uh, well, four or five packs of SMDs like this, which actually those were, at the time I was using two capacitors per pack, not four like I have here. But basically I had something, actually no, I might have been using four packs. Either way, I, a couple, like a few thousand, like not anything, not in excess of 10,000 microfarads even, and I was already seeing improvements that I just wasn't seeing with much larger quantities of these, um, just because the card was different. So, your mileage will vary depending on what you're working on. Um, but yeah, so choosing the capacitors is a bit of a mess. Uh, 
I say you should probably pick up a little bit of everything. Um, generally, more capacitors of a smaller size will outperform one big capacitor. So, like, if you have... You know, this is 2,000 microfarads. I can pretty much guarantee that this is never going to beat 2,000 microfarads of these little small ones, because these are 560. Uh, 560 microfarad. And basically the reason for that is, is each of these individually is rated for like 7 milliohms ESR. Uh, so when you put four of them together in parallel, they're effectively one fourth of that. This, on the other hand, is 7 milliohm ESR. And at that point, you know, there's four of these guys, same ESR rating on these. These are going to win. So, yeah, that that's something to keep in mind. Also, I got these, you know, like I actually went and hunted for a really small package like this because I wanted for like multi GPU setups. The fact of the matter is when you're using these, <laughs> the cards don't fit next to each other because they pretty much add a slot of thickness behind the card. So that kind of sucks, which is another advantage for the SMDs. Like you can get high capacitances for the SMD stuff and they're like really low profile, which is nice. Um, and then a sort of nice middle ground if you don't want to go ridiculous with like 2000 microfarads or this is a 15,000 microfarad here. Um, you can also get 820 microfarad, which is really popular. These are pretty good value. Um, Nichicon FP series, I just get them off a of DigiKey. Um, and those, I think, are 5 milliohm ESR. So basically, when you're choosing your capacitors, you want really low ESR, as low as you're willing to pay for, because, well, let's just put it this way. I have a few capacitors here, which cost, I think, like $2 a piece. And they're, 4, uh, they're 470 microfarads each, whereas... This is 1,500 microfarads and costs half a dollar. So, yeah, you know, um, y you can spend some pretty impressive amounts of money on just capacitors, especially once you try to get a significant capacitance with them. So that's a bit of an issue. And then I've recently started experimenting with multi-layer ceramics, but I've not yet found out if they do anything, mostly because this card right here, well, I broke it in testing, which we'll cover very soon. But multi-layer ceramics, they're tiny, so they're going to be a nightmare to show to this unfortunate camera. Come on, camera, you can do it. There, that's a multi-layer ceramic. These are four, uh, 47 microfarad, uh, and that's pretty much all, and 4 volts rated. That's pretty much all I can tell you about them. They don't come with an ESR spec. They don't come with an impedance spec. They don't come with anything, basically. Uh, other than that, but generally speaking, multi-layer ceramics are way higher frequency response than, well, say, a giant can like this. Um, generally, the bigger the thing, the bigger the capacitor is, and the higher the capacitance, the slower its response is going to be. That's just a general rule of thumb, though you can get things like uh, prodlizers, which are these sort of flat pack capacitors, and you can get those. They're huge. And you can get them in very, and just because of the weird packaging style they have, they actually are really good in terms of performance. They're just kind of hard to find, really expensive, and in my opinion, a pain to work with because they're huge. And, like, they're designed, like, they're not, they don't come, they're an SMD type capacitor. So you're going to need to figure out some way to solder it in places. And that's going to end up with a lot of wiring, probably. So I'm not a fan of those. I prefer to just use regular SMDs instead. And, uh, yeah, so that's sort of covering the choosing the capacitors. Sorry I didn't have give, give you a solid conclusion as, well, it kind of varies card to card. And, uh, yeah, depending on your application and really how much you're, you're willing to spend, I am kind of looking into trying to review capacitors, which is why I was pulling cap, like, putting capacitors on and off this card over and over and over again until I eventually broke the damn thing, so now I have to go and find a dip, well, probably start over and just avoid all the multi-layer ceramics on this thing because those things are fragile. Which, yeah, that's actually, let's talk downsides. So, thing about multi-layer ceramics, these tiny little things, is they're really temperature sensitive and they're not exactly physically robust. So they're easy to, like, if you have them too hot for too long, they'll burn up on you. If you try to, like, if you manhandle them a bit, um, you're going to break off the contacts on them, and they're going to not work very well. If you, well, basically, th th those die a lot. And actually, the same goes for all the other capacitor types, except something this big has a, you know, 
something like this has a lot more thermal mass, so this is a lot harder to overheat than a tiny little, basically this is smaller than a grain of rice type capacitor deal. So, yeah, whereas the aluminum polymers, like these are really easy to work with. They're, these are pretty robust. Um, though, actually, that reminds me, these have the advantage, like the, the multi-layer ceramics, <laughs> these are really annoying to work with on camera. The multi-layer ceramics have the advantage that they're non-polar, so you can plug them in whichever way, and as long as the voltage is lowered, well, they're not polarized, so which, you can plug them in whatever way, and it doesn't matter as long as the voltage isn't higher than what the capacitor is rated for. So if you have a four volt uh, multi-layer ceramic, you can slap it on literally anything that's less than four volts, right? And it doesn't matter which way you put it, you don't need to check it, which, which side is ground, which side is positive, as long as it doesn't go over four volts, you're fine. Um, with the aluminum polymers, tantalums, and you know, even regular old uh, liquid electrolyte uh, aluminum capacitors, if you put these in reverse, they explode violently. So don't put them in reverse. And reverse, so red stripe is ground, long leg goes to positive. Yeah, <laughs> looking at the card to check because I tend to get that mixed up. But also here you can see this one. This one is a slightly different packaging. It's not paint, like it's not printed on or painted on. It has this plastic coating, well, plastic shell thing. And it has this negative stripe. So this indicates ground again. And yeah, you just need to keep the track of that because if you put them in reverse, they're gonna blow up and potentially kill the card with them. So that's one of the other risks with these. Now then, finding actual mounting points. Obviously, if your card has through-hole capacitors, the legs of those are super easy to use because you can just read the orientation of the existing capacitors and copy it with yours. Very low risk, very easy to do, but not necessarily super rewarding because as the closer you can get the capacitors to the actual GPU core, the better your performance, at least in theory, will, the better the, well, the more help the capacitors will be, at least in theory. And that starts to get into the issues. And also you sometimes get cards which just don't have any, <clears throat> any through hold components and you're stuck soldering onto, well, SMD type capacitors or even ceramics. And, you know, ceramics not being polar, uh, not being polarized means you need to figure out which side goes to voltage and which side goes to ground. And I assume most of you would like to do that without having the card turned on and running. So the way to do that is you find something that you know for sure is ground. And in most cases, a screw hole is a great candidate. So like here. That's a screw hole. And then you can just check. And I'm just going to take that tab right there. And you're going to notice that the resistance, it is very low. This is a GTX 680. So it has about 10 ohms from, you know, V core to ground. And actually, if I measured off of a different closer ground pad, something that isn't necessarily the there. So now I'm using a different ground. And you'll notice that we're now reading under 10 ohms. That's perfectly normal for a GPU core. Um, in fact, the 680 here is a very high resistance uh, compared to what I'm used to dealing with, which unfortunately I don't have a card. Okay, well, unfortunately I don't have the GTX 590 or a Vega sitting anywhere right now, but on a GTX 590, for example, it is completely normal to measure, say, half an ohm from V core to ground. So if you're measuring some ridiculously low resistance, don't worry, your card probably isn't shorted out unless your multimeter really, really sucks. Um, but even mine can recognize, like even mine can tell between shorted out GTX 590 and working GTX 590. So as long as you're reading a resistance that isn't super like zero, um, you're fine in general. Unless you're working on Pascal, because say the GTX 1070, GTX 1080, GTX 1080 Ti, Titan XP, all of these cards have GPU core resistances of less than 0.1. Well, in some cases, less than 0.1 ohms. At which point you need to go and get a four, uh, a four point uh, multimeter, which those cost a lot of money. And uh, 
yeah. Uh, so working on those cards is really hard. Unless, of course, you're using giant amounts of multi-layer ceramic capacitors, because these are non they're not polarized, so you can just slap them on willy-nilly, and as long as you're putting them on V-Core, you're fine. Um, if you put them on 12 volts, then obviously they'll just burn out. But, uh, yeah, you know, that makes cap modding those kinds of cards a lot harder, because their resistance is just so low that you can't measure it. Vega is a similar issue, except Vega registers for me on this multimeter as 0 0.2, which is really like pushing my comfort but you know yeah it, it's still something and at least vega has a lot of unoccupied smd capacitor mounts which is another thing smd capacitor mounts are a great candidate for a mounting point um for example this right here right you can sort of see there's a white stripe wait why is it suddenly so dark on camera I don't think I changed the lightning. Anyway, there is a white stripe on one side of an SMD capacitor's mount to indicate which uh, side is positive. So, you know, if you're using existing capacitor mounts, it's very easy. If you're soldering onto multi-layer ceramic mounts or multi-layer ceramics, you kind of need to do a resistance check. Um, and for GPU cores, yeah, you're going to be looking at resistances that range from basically, I think, maybe 50 ohms on something really, like some very small chip, like a GT, GT710 type deal, you know, like, uh, or a GT1030 or an RX, okay, no, that's modern. Actually, a GT1030 is also pretty modern, but if it's like large manufacturing process, like 28 nanometer and really small GPU core, um, then it'll actually measure a really relatively high resistance. If you have a big GPU core, modern manufacturing process, it's going to measure a really low resistance. A Fury X, for example, registers at around 1.7. So, actually, not even one. Yeah, no, 1.7 at 290X is like two point something. So you get the idea. Your resistance for a GPU core is going to be really low. But the GPU cores aren't the only things you can add capacitors to. Memory is also something you can add capacitors to. And memory is a similar deal, except much higher resistance. Again, you just do resistance checks across things. So that right there is the memory VRM. And you can see that's about 134 uh, ohms, 135. So if I want to find another memory capacitor, then I'll just check, say, this one. And if that one measures 135, then I know it's, yeah, that's, that's memory power. So I could add a capacitor right there, right behind the memory chip. Um, and the reason why you actually want to check all of your multi-layer ceramics on memory chips and not just assume that they're definitely uh, for memory is because some of these are actually different voltages that register as different resistances. If I can get through the... Okay, well, that one's still 136. Let's try to find one, because I know there's, like, on the GTX 1070 when I was modding that, made the mistake of soldering I think I was supposed to only solder on capacitors registering as 150 ish something like that and I soldered on to something that registered as 70 so that was kind of concerning for a little bit but well if we take this one in the center hoping that one's something different come on this is Tin on this thing is so dirty. Finally getting a measurement. Oh, that's still 135. Oh, well, it depends on the memory architecture. Like, GDDR5X actually has an extra supporting voltage entirely, and that one's at 1 1.8 volts, so you want to be careful with that one. You definitely don't want to accidentally hit it with a 2-volt capacitor, but... Yeah, you can basically just do resistance checks on things to figure out which capacitors are fine to use and which ones aren't. Uh, you can probably guess which ones are good candidates based on, well, is it easy? Is it potentially easy for me to solder onto it? And is it near the thing I'm trying to, pa uh, to, to mod? So if you're modding V-Core, you're going to look behind the core and near the V-Core VRM. If you're modding memory, then you'll look near the memory VRM and near the me memory chips. Um, Though, actually, I think, well, this one right here is a memory capacitor. I know that for sure. Though, there's memory chips right next to that. But some cards will have them, like, memory, 
memory bypass capacitors will be sort of closer to the core than what this card necessarily has. But uh, yeah, so that's sort of choosing your spots. There's also inductors, which inductors you can't resistance check. Um, and if you get the wrong side of an inductor on a GPU core, it's gonna blow your capacitor to, well, if you get the wrong side of an inductor with the capacitor, it's gonna blow the, induct uh, the capacitor to pieces. And it's also going to um, break the VRM. Pretty much guaranteed it's gonna destroy the VRM and you're gonna lose the card. So if you don't know what, like, basically I would recommend you avoid soldering onto inductors. And you might think, okay, well, maybe I can do like a voltage check while the card is running. You can't, you have to uh, check. Well, basically just avoid them, okay? Because if you don't have an oscilloscope, you won't know which side of the inductor is being switched to 12 volts. I mean, under most circumstances, if you look at the way the VRM is laid out, you can figure out which side of the capacitor the inductor is hooked up to the MOSFETs and which side goes to the GPU core. But, you know, if, if you don't, if you want to play it safe, just don't solder onto inductors at all because one side goes all the way to 12 volts. If you solder onto that side, it's going to destroy the capacitor and all and the MOSFETs. So the VRM is going to go bye bye as well, and you're you're going to be with uh, left with potentially a dead card. So you know, recommend not. I recommend avoiding the uh, uh, inductors. As I mentioned earlier, also with multi-layer ceramics, you know, they really come apart easy. So if you're soldering a lot of stuff onto multi-layer ceramics, you're going to want to be really careful putting the card down on the actual side where the capacitors are located, which kind of sucks. But yeah, that is definitely a precaution you will have to take because, you know, put some kind of foam padding under the card or something because... If you rest the card on just the capacitors themselves, they will break off the, the multi-layer ceramics. Their mounts aren't meant for basically structural support. So, yeah, that's another risk. Um, also, in some cases, you know, you might want to add extra capacitors to your 12 volt inputs. <clears throat> in which case, what you have to keep in mind is that you do not have a single 12 volt power plane. So if we actually go, and I'm gonna show you that one side of that cap is ground. So if we measure one, that's ground. Come on, that's, gr no, okay, that side's ground. There, that's the ground side. If we go to this side, that's the 12 volt side. You can see that's measuring uh, over a couple kilo ohms, that's normal. So if we go and check another capacitor on that same side, which I think this is ground for that one. Yeah, that's ground as well. If we measure from this one to this one, you'll notice we're actually getting several, like almost, yeah, we're getting several kilo ohms again. And the reason for that is really, really simple. Um, this card has an eight pin and a six pin. Therefore, this card does not like the six pin and the eight pin have separate power planes. So basically you want to add, like if you're adding capacitors, you're gonna add only like if you have um, if you add capacitors to, like if you only add one capacitor, you're only adding extra capacitance to one of the 12 volt connectors. And also remember your PCIe slot is also another source of 12 volts. So if you're doing 12 volts, uh, adding extra 12 volts capacitors, uh, you need to add, like I generally add one to each connector and then two to each connector and like keep it even. Um, otherwise, well, one of your connectors is not gonna be as filtered as the other one. So, unless you're using a daisy chain, but you probably shouldn't be doing that if you're using any high power cards, and we've gone over that in a different video, but, yeah. That's another thing with the 12 volts, and actually, uh, filtering the 12 volts, I honestly don't think you should bother with that unless you have a terrible power supply, at which point I would suggest you just don't use your terrible power supply and go get a better power supply, because honestly, that's a better solution, like, you can use that power supply long term, you know, it's not gonna burn down your hardware and all that. It's like, if your power supply is so bad that you need to add extra capacitors to things, get a better power supply. Um, but you know, if you're in the situation where there simply is no more space for extra capacitors on vCore and everywhere else on the card, and there's literally you're stacking capacitors on the legs of other capacitors at that point, um, you know, there's no more space then yeah, you might want to consider adding some extra filtering to 12 volts, but 
um, generally it doesn't do anything for my testing. It's really like, the, the probability that it'll help is really, really low. Um, most of the time it won't do anything, so it's probably like, you know, I'm not saying don't do it, but make sure you've done everything else before you bother with that, because it's it definitely the least likely to help uh, in, improve your overclocking. So yeah, I think I covered pretty much everything at this point and made this video ridiculously long. Oh, I didn't! It's only 40 minutes! That's an achievement! <laughs> I was worried this would hit an hour. Anyway, um, yeah, that's it for cap modding. I think I covered everything. You know, um, you can resistance check for basically check, you can just do a resistance check to figure out where to mount your capacitors. Um, as far as capacitors, make sure you have voltage headroom. Your only tr trade off with extra, uh, you know, high voltage rated capacitors is that they're going to be bigger and they're generally going to have worse specs for the same amount of money or high or even potentially more money. So, yeah, um, that's, uh, that's, that's everything, isn't it? I don't think I'm missing anything. Give me a second, I wrote down some notes for this video. Or I'm just gonna give them a glance to make sure I'm not missing anything. Because I forgot to put the notes on the desk. Um, careful with ceramics, we've done that, improve... Yeah. Oh, right, I forgot to mention. Um, this does, this entire modification, we didn't go over any downsides, ignoring the fact that, you know, if you do it wrong, you can kill your GPU. Um, it does have a downside. It will lower your VRM efficiency. However, it might prolong the lifespan of all the capacitors already on the card because they'll be doing less work. So, yeah. Um, and it won't really lower VRM efficiency a whole lot. Um, at least, I've not really been focusing on testing that, but I guess that might be worth checking out. Um, Though I'm not sure that this pile of garbage is accurate enough to be relied on um, for that kind of testing. So, because I don't think it's going to make very big measurable differences. And th this is really not good for anything smaller than a tenth of an amp. Um, and even a tenth of an amp, I wouldn't really trust it for. But, yeah. Um, extra capacitors will lower your VRM efficiency. Not a huge amount, but they will. Um... So, yeah, um, that, that is it. I, I've now, I am now confident I've actually covered everything there is to cover uh, until somebody drops a comment about how I missed some random topic that uh, I just forgot. But, yeah, um, that's cap modding. I, I do recommend uh, trying it if, you know, because it's definitely like, if you're volt modding and power modding, especially older NVIDIA graphics cards, worth trying it. Um, any VRM with less than four phases, worth trying it. If it has more than four phases or is made by AMD, you probably won't help anything. Uh, and I'm basing this off of the fact that um, HD5870, which as far as I remember, the reference card for that is a four phase, didn't care at all. Um, no amount of extra capacitors made a single like amount, like even the smallest amount of difference to that thing. Um, the Vega, I measured the Vega with an oscilloscope, that thing was registering 100 millivolts, <laughs> peak to peak, so, you know, that was literally half of what this thing registers on, on the same test, so, yeah, um, you know, and that's a 12-phase VRM, so I'm really not surprised there, but old, cheap, crappy gr graphics cards. That's where this mod shines. If you try to do it on something high end, it's probably not going to do anything. Um, it, it You can do it on motherboards, but generally people do it on graphics cards because generally people don't buy terrible motherboards. But I have um, tested this mod on a motherboard, and on some it does help. Like I had a, there's that three phase Z270N from Gigabyte, the LGA 1151 motherboard I used for a bit. That thing actually benefited from a few extra these capacitors. Uh, I added four of these, and it actually dropped in terms of voltage requirements for Cinebench. So, yeah. Um, really depends on what your initial VRM is. If you have a trash VRM to start with, extra caps can fix it. 
If you have a great VRM to start with, you're probably not going to do anything. And at this point, I think I've repeated myself enough times on every point that we can wrap up the video. So thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Huge thanks to the Patreons for funding some of these capacitors because, well, as I said earlier, I paid like $2 a piece for some of these. Um, they're not cheap. <laughs> if you if you want the best, like, because basically I, some of these I literally went and was just like lowest ESR for some ridiculous capacitance and I was like, oh, well, we're buying that. But uh, yeah, thanks to the Patreons for basically funding this video as well as the 680. Um, and... Like, share, subscribe, I said. Comments, I said. Patreon, I mentioned. There's also a PayPal. There's shirts. I actually fixed some of the shirts, so if you're from the EU and you wanted a Raise V Core shirt in black, uh, those are now available in single units. So, yeah, uh, fix that. And uh, that is it for this video. So, thank you for watching one last time, and goodbye. Where'd the mouse go? Oh, there it went. Also, that that one turns on, you start seeing the voltage drop down instead of rise up. So you get voltage fluctuations just due to the switching uh, of the VRM itself. Um, and this can be negated with more phases, faster switching frequencies. You know, you, you can get VRMs that even without very many capacitors would run ridiculously clean. But unfortunately, we do not live in a world where um, GPUs and other silicon semiconductors like RAM and and CPUs, they, they do not run on constant current. If they were constant current, um, VRMs would have a very easy time of dealing with that. It'd be really easy. No, uh, GPU cores are constant voltage and current varying wildly. In fact, um, for comparison's sake, that's the kind of voltage fluctuation you see in GT1. This is what GT2 looks like. You can actually tell what input, what freaking workload the GPU is doing based on the pattern of voltage fluctuation in the, in, in, on the back of the GPU core, because basically when the voltage goes up, the GPU is doing less work. When the voltage goes down, the GPU is doing more work, pulling more current, and you can see that reflected in those voltage graphs over there, um, which is, you know, like, that's why you do cap mods, to reduce that voltage fluctuation as much as possible. Because basically what happens is the VRM is not really aware exactly of what the GPU is doing. If the GPU told the VRM in advance, hey, uh, watch out, I'm about to ask for 200 amps and we're only doing 20 now, the VRM wouldn't have an issue. But that's not what actually happens. The GPU goes from, say, uh, 20 amps current load to 200 in basically instantly. Uh, and the VRM lags behind that. Um, and since the VRM lags behind that, what would normally happen is the inductors would just discharge until there's no more voltage left in them. And that, that would be just a catastrophe. Your voltage would fluctuate up and down because ultimately the inductors in a VRM are trying to push a constant current. And if your current is not constant, they're going to push the voltage up and down to try get the current constant. So if your current draw drops massively, they drive the voltage up. If your current draw increases massively, your voltage goes down for inductors. Now, uh, capacitors are what is used to deal with that because they will basically, if the voltage starts going up, the capacitors will soak up the excess energy that the inductors are dumping in the form of that extra voltage. Well, they're trying to dump it, so they're driving up the voltage. Um, so you can have capacitors and they'll basically soak up that excess energy. Uh, and then when there is a shortage of power for the GPU core, the capacitors will drop it. And that's uh, why you would want to add capacitors, because if you have more capacitance, well, more capacitance or better capacitors, or there, there's a variety of variables here, you can't just, you know, you can't just go and buy a super capacitor and expect it to do a great job of uh, basically ripple suppression on very high switching frequencies because really high frequency stuff needs really low inductance. And uh, that's why, you know, right behind the GPU core, you have, which actually, can I get it into shot? There we go. Right behind the GPU core, you have this massive mixture of, you have the large SMD, and I think these are just regular aluminum polymers, not anything fancy like tantalums. Um, you have the large SMD polymers, and then around that you have all of these different sized ceramics, uh, 
And that's because various size capacitors, different packaging types have completely different uh, frequency responses. And then if you actually look at a GPU core, you have all of those little chip capacitors right around those. And you may notice some of them have an even funky, like a, uh, well, they have a different packaging than what you normally see right behind the core to further reduce uh, their inductance so that they're even faster to respond to sudden changes in power requirements. So, you know, basically you just pile on capacitors of various sizes and various capacitances to get as stable voltage as possible. Now, unsurprisingly, um, GPU manufacturers will kind of say, okay, past a certain point, uh, adding more capacitors is just not worth it. It's either physically not possible to fit on the PCB or it just costs too much and it's not worth the effort. I mean, as long as the card runs stock clocks, nobody cares that, oh, you know, uh, an extra 2,000, 10,000 microfarads of capacitance would increase overclocking potential by 10 megahertz, which is really what we're talking about here. Like, I think four or five little SMDs, uh, well, four or five packs of SMDs like this, which actually those were, at the time I was using two capacitors per pack, not four like I have here. But basically, I had something... Actually, no, I might have been using four packs. Either way, I... A couple, like, a few thousand, like, not anything, not in excess of 10,000 microfarads even, and I was already seeing improvements that I just wasn't seeing with much larger quantities of these, um, just because the card was different. So, your mileage will vary, depending on what you're working on. Um, but, yeah, so choosing the capacitors is a bit of a mess. I say you should probably pick up a little bit of everything. Um, generally, more capacitors of a smaller size will outperform one big capacitor. So like if you have, you know, this is 2000 microfarads, I can pretty much guarantee that this is never gonna beat 2000 microfarads of these little small ones, because these are 560, uh, 560 microfarad. And basically the reason for that is, is each of these individually is rated for like seven milliohms ESR. Uh, so when you put four of them together in parallel, they're effectively one fourth of that. This on the other hand is seven milliohm ESR, and at that point, you know, there's four of these guys, same ESR rating on these, these are gonna win. So, yeah, that that's something to keep in mind. Also, I got these in a, like, I actually went and hunted for a really small package like this because I wanted for like multi-GPU setups. The fact of the matter is, when you're using these, <laughs> the cards don't fit next to each other because they pretty much add a slot of thickness behind the card. So that kind of sucks, which is another advantage for the SMDs. Like, you can get high capacitances for the SMD stuff, and they're, like, really low profile, which is nice. Um, and then a sort of nice middle ground, if you don't want to go ridiculous with, like, 2,000 microfarads, or this is a 15,000 microfarad here, um, you can also get 820 microfarad, which is really popular. These are pretty good value. Um, Nichicon FP series, I just get them off a of DigiKey. Um, and those, I think, are 5 milliohm ESR. So basically, when you're choosing your capacitors, you want really low ESR, as low as you're willing to pay for, because, well, let's just put it this way. I have a few capacitors here, which cost, I think, like $2 a piece. And they're, 4, uh, they're 470 microfarads each, whereas this is 1,500 microfarads and cost half a dollar. So, yeah, you know, um you can spend some pretty impressive amounts of money on just capacitors, especially once you try to get a significant capacitance with them. So that's a bit of an issue. And then I've recently started experimenting with multi-layer ceramics, but I've not yet found out if they do anything, mostly because this card right here, well, I broke it in testing, which we'll cover very soon. But multi-layer ceramics, they're tiny, so they're gonna be a nightmare to show to this unfortunate camera. Come on camera, you can do it. There, that's a multi-layer ceramic. These are four, uh, 47 microfarad, uh, and that's pretty much all, and four volts rated. That's pretty much all I can tell you about them. They don't come with an ESR spec. They don't come with an impedance spec. They don't come with anything basically uh, other than that. But generally speaking, multi-layer ceramics are way higher frequency response than, well, say a giant can like this. Um, generally, the bigger the thing, the bigger the capacitor is, and the higher the capacitance, the slower its response is going to be. That's just a general rule of thumb, though you can get things like uh, prodlizers, which are these sort of flat pack capacitors, 
and you can get those they're huge and you can get them in very and just because of the weird packaging style they have they actually are really good in terms of performance they're just kind of hard to find really expensive and in my opinion a pain to work with because they're huge and like they're designed like they're not they don't come they're an smd type capacitor so you're gonna need to figure out some way to solder it in places and that's gonna end up with a lot of wiring probably so i'm not a fan of those i prefer to just use regular smds instead and uh yeah so that's sort of covering the choosing the capacitors sorry i didn't have give, give you a solid conclusion as well it kind of varies card to card and uh yeah depending on your application and really how much you're you're willing to spend i am kind of looking into trying to review capacitors which is why i was pulling cap like putting cap because that's the kind of gains you you might end up seeing um it really varies card to card in my experience uh, say amd reference cards i've seen terrible and i mean terrible results in terms of cap modding and actually getting any improvement and then there's things like this gtx 680 which uh well, before I broke it, it picked up a nice 15 me megahertz on the core clock, and then before, in earlier testing, it picked up 30, but then it's like, this card has had so many, like, I've put caps on, pulled them off, put them back on, pull, well, can't actually see the card. I put caps on, on this thing, pulled them off, and put them back on so many times that at this point, I'm kind of w w worried that I've, well... I've damaged a lot of the multi-layer ceramics on this thing, uh, and it's already starting to, like, I, I can't replicate some of the results I have from earlier testing, so I think um, that on for that capacitor right in that area, well, you can't see it, but whatever. Either way, um, <laughs> this card's in a pretty bad shape, but it does pick up a few extra megahertz from the extra capacitors, and, you know, if you're in the business of extreme overclocking, then... A few extra megahertz by just adding capacitors is really not that bad a trade. So, yeah, and basically the difference between, say, without capacitors and with capacitors looks something like this. Now, don't actually look at the graph itself because, uh, well, they're different scaling. So one of them is, I think, 112 millivolts per division, while the other one is like 100 millivolts per division. So they're not accurate. Like, you, you can't eyeball them and say, oh yeah, this one's smaller than the other. It's smaller because the scales are different. But the lower graphs, you will notice that there is all of the little monitoring tabs at the bottom of it. And basically the lower graphs were done on, uh, well, I can't show you now because the graphs are there, but eh. Anyway, um, the lower graphs, uh, I added a whole bunch of capacitance, like 24,000 microfarads, which is a huge amount. Like, that's absolutely massive. That's several multiples of what this card normally comes with. And it's not actually necessary. It's just I have conveniently sized, tw well, it was convenient to fit 12 2,000 microfarad capacitors onto this, so I did that. Um, but anyway, what you'll notice is that under the actual graph, I have various monitors. So there's like voltage maximum, voltage minimum, average voltage, and VPP. So VPP stands for voltage peak to peak. Um, and you'll notice that in the top graphs, the GT1, uh, you're seeing about 220 millivolts peak to peak voltage difference. And GT2, I think is 230 millivolts. Whereas for the GT1, uh, GT1 and GT2 tests with the much larger uh, with the extra capacitors, it's actually seeing about 200 millivolts peak to peak. And that basically means there's less voltage fluctuation. It's going less high and less low um, as the load cycles through Firestrike. And actually, the uh, extra 12, uh, you know, the extra 24,000 microfarads led to an overclocking improvement on this card of about 15 megahertz uh, against uh, previous testing. So they do help. They, they definitely do help, not necessarily a ton, not always, uh, and, and some card, like, it really depends on the card. If you take a card which is, like, excellent out of the factory, like, say, a Lightning, a Matrix, or a Hall of Fame, and you start piling capacitors onto that, the probability of them actually helping anything is basically zero, because, well, Galax and Asus and MSI have kind of done that for you, but if you have old junk hardware, 
or some junk reference card and you want to bench it for hardware points, then adding extra capacitors is a great way to pick up a few extra megahertz, which may help you get first place. Also note that all of this testing was done at stock voltage because it's faster for me without having to figure out how to mod like, because this card, as far as I know, doesn't support software voltage control, or at least I don't mess with NVIDIA's enough to know how to do it without a hard mod. And I kind of say, I'm kind of saving the hard voltage hard mod on this thing for a future video. So uh, this was all done on stock voltage. If you actually crank up the output voltage of the VRM, then obviously the amount of current the GPU is pulling increases, which means those voltage graphs would actually look worse. Um, and the potential for the extra capacitors to improve them would be larger. So the difference between no mods and with mods would be larger if I was running a higher voltage than that 1.14 average that you're actually... Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at cap modding, which is one of my personal favorite modifications because it's really easy, and that's by my standards, not by normal people's standards, obviously, but it is a simple modification. It doesn't require any data sheets. Um, you just, like, it is easy to screw up, that, that's for sure. Basically, any hardware modification you do, if you short circuit V-core to ground, dead card. If you do, you know, it, there's a lot of things, as soon as you start using a soldering iron on a PCB, there's a lot of things that no matter what you're doing are always gonna be a risk. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but unlike, say, volt mods or uh, trying to modify power limits or disable some kind of power limit or, uh, something like that, this is a lot easier compared to that because those require that you figure out how the voltage, some random voltage controller, which may or may not have good documentation works and then actually, you know, getting it to, and then actually applying that modification. Whereas here you just need to not do some, like, you know, not do s certain stupid things and end up with a card that doesn't work. But, uh, yeah, so... Why would you want to cap mod? So cap modding is basically, you know, I'm, I'm not actually sure how I'm going to do go about this video, but um, normally if we talk about a voltage on when overclocking, you know, uh, like say this GTX uh, 680 here, this is a pallet GeForce 680. So it's not a reference board though. It might look like it's a reference card because of the cooler, but it's not. It has an eight pin and a six pin, not a six plus six, um, which I think a stock 680 is two six pins. But uh, yeah, this is a six plus eight. The VRM is some kind of six phase, I think. It might be a doubled up three, but yeah, it's not, not a great card. Um, but you know, if you run this thing, GPU-Z reports that this thing is running on 1.175 volts. Now, if you actually go and take a multimeter right to the back of the core, you'll find out it's not running at 1.175 volts at all. It's running at around 1.15 because the VRM is over here and the GPU is there. So basically there's a ton of voltage drop going from, you know, it, it dumps all of its power here. And then you have all of this copper going, basically one of these phases is gonna be strained a lot more than all the other ones because it's closer to the, uh, GPU core. So yeah, you end up in a situation that um, this doesn't actually get the voltage that the software reports because of voltage drop. But you know, that's not a huge issue. What's a lot more concerning and what the cap mod actually takes care of is the fact that the voltage on, right behind the GPU core when you check it with an oscilloscope looks like this. Um, that's from 3D Mark Fire Strike Graphics Test 1. Bone stock PCB. The only thing I added was basically this tab right here. This, that little tab. And that's there so that I could hook up the oscilloscope to something. Come on, focus, you useless camera. It's not that hard to focus. My little brother can focus to, better than this. Come on. Oh, whatever. I give up. So that little tab over there, uh, that's for measuring the voltage right behind the GPU core. And then for grounding, I have another tab down here. Um, obviously, I tried to get the tabs as close to the GPU core as possible so that I'm measuring the voltage fluctuations right here because actually if I move this tab from here to the end of this VRM, which I did have that once, you get wildly different uh, readings for, uh, for the voltage fluctuations. So what you're seeing there is I can't actually see what you're seeing right now because I'm trying to do this while recording, which is genius, but whatever. Um, 
What you're seeing over there right now is that the voltage is really not steady. And in fact, it's fluctuating between, memory serves me correctly, 1.03 volts at the lowest and 1.26 volts at peak. So that basically means this VRM and then obviously the GPU core itself because the, the reason for all of that voltage fluctuation is part of it is the VRM. The VRM has MOSFET switching on and off in it. Um, when the high side MOSFET in a phase turns on, the voltage output of that phase starts going up. Um, and so naturally the voltage you see on the entire thing starts going up uh, with it. And that causes some fluctuations. And when, you know, that FET shuts off and it switches to the low side, mostly we'll seeing on those graphs. So um, now let's put those graphs off the screen and talk about actually implementing this modification because you decided that several hours and, you know, the potential of a dead card is actually worth 15 megahertz. Um, well, uh, it's actually really easy to do this modification. And first of all, you know, uh, you'd have your selection of capacitors. So basically with choosing your capacitors, you won't need to choose capacitors that are rated for a higher voltage than whatever you're trying to uh, regulate. And you want to give yourself a lot of headroom up top, um, by which I mean, this technically runs on like 1.14 volts average. If they made 1.2 volt capacitors, I wouldn't use them on this because this peaked according to those oscilloscope shots at 1.26 and that would kill those capacitors. They wouldn't survive that much voltage. So basically, um, you need to get some extra headroom in. So, you know, there's no downside to using a massive capacitor except that you're gonna pay a lot more money and you're not gonna get as good specs as if you buy a smaller one. So you can get some ridiculous, uh, like low electro uh, equivalent series resistances on capacitors spec at say two volts um, for really cheap. Like you can get really cheap two volt capacitors with incredible ESR. The only downside is they're two volts. So you can't use them on anything that runs on say 1.8 because if something runs on 1.8, then there's a pretty good chance it might spike above one, two volts for a short period of time and the capacitors won't necessarily survive that. So you want to have some headroom. So if you're modding something like an AM3 plus motherboard, um, then you'd want to use like a three volt or a four volt capacitor because on AM3 plus on liquid nitrogen, you'd run as much as 2.1 volts or even 2.2 on some CPUs. Um, and you know, if you had a two and a half volt capacitor, it wouldn't necessarily survive that. Uh, similarly, you know, if, if if you're working on, say, a Pascal series graphics card, which these top out at like 1.6, then knock yourself out, use a two volt capacitor. Um, here, the basically the ones that you saw in the graphs were these red ones. These are the 2000 microfarads. These are 6.3 volts rated, 5,000 hours, seven milliohm ESR. And, you know, they're, they're big, they're bulky. They work pretty good as they did manage to make this thing overclock better. But, uh, you know, uh, it kind of depends what you're aiming for. They are really big and they're very high capacitance and they won't necessarily always help that much. Um, generally, you'll notice that assuming you have enough of them, small SMDs like this kind, which actually these are set four SMD capacitors uh, sort of soldered together into this more convenient uh, cell thing. I don't know what to call this group, bank, whatever. Um, basically I pack them up like this so that I can, you know, they're easier to solder onto things cause they actually have legs and I'm not relying on finding existing pads for SMDs. Now there is a downside to like repackaging them like this. And that is basically any extra wire length, uh, reduces the capabilities of the capacitors to suppress high frequency, uh, voltage fluctuations. Now, generally, um, you know, so you basically want to keep your wiring short. The shorter, the better, but you don't have to go absolutely crazy on it because, you know, even, well, even this length works just fine. It just depends on what you're working with. So, yeah, so I use these. And then of course, if you want, so these are tantalums. You can also get aluminum polymers in an SMD package. Those are actually really, really great um, in general. I've had good experiences with them. Other people have had good experiences with using them for cap mods as well. Um, these big one, like, you know, your usual can, can type, can style polymers, they're cheap, like really cheap. Um, they're much cheaper than the SMD stuff, but they won't all like, they're not as good. They're not as high performance. They won't always yield any results. 
Um, but, you know, they're so cheap, it's like you might pick up, with the sum, up some as well. And also there's some cards where they're just capacitance hogs, like this thing. This needs a huge amount of capacitance to, like, improve at all. Um, because even when I was using tantalums, I needed at least uh, 18,000 microfarads to make an improvement in terms of uh, overclocking on this thing. So that sucked. But that, <laughs> that sucks on this card. But then there's other cards where, you know, a couple... Uh,